<laughs> You're wondering why, because I, I originally planned to call this Looking Forward to Heaven, which is um, what I wanted to talk about today. But then I thought, okay, I'll make it technically right, because we don't actually spend eternity in heaven. We spend eternity on the new earth. So um, then I just said, oh, okay, I'll just call it the new earth. So that's what I'm talking about today. Um, and um, yeah, the, I guess the reason why I just wanted to preach on this today, I just want to encourage you, you know, we talk about having an uh, a eternal perspective, and sometimes it's good to remember, like, you know, that, you know, when you have an eternal perspective, it's, there's something to look forward to, you know, in the afterlife, there's something to look forward to that is so much better than what we have now, uh, because life is hard, you know, life is not easy, you know, and uh, it's not meant to be easy, so this is why when life is hard, uh, you, sh- you should expect that. You shouldn't be surprised that life is hard. Life is not meant to be easy. And uh, we see this in Genesis 3, where God says to the man and the woman, after they'd sinned, and we now, you know, it's hard because we live in a fallen world. It wasn't not intentionally, it w- the, in the original intent of God was not to make it hard. It was meant to be perfect. The Garden of Eden was a paradise. But because of sin, it's not perfect. And life is hard. He says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I was just thinking, and this might be a bit of a rabbit trail, but I was just having a conversation with somebody recently, and I was just wondering what, what childbirth was like prior to the fall. Was, was there still like, you know, the women's monthly cycles and things like that? but there just wasn't the pain. <laughs> because, you know, we're saying, like, maybe there's still the biological things of, you know, flushing out the egg and everything like that, but it just wasn't, you know, maybe as sorrowful and painful. You know, maybe, maybe it still happened, but it just wasn't the pain, so it wasn't necessarily anything wrong with the bleeding. Um, he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, verse 17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So you see how it's like the ground also didn't bring forth as well as it did prior to the fall. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. So it's thorns and thistles did not exist prior to the fall. And now there's these weeds that are not only weeds, but are weeds that can sometimes be poisonous or can hurt you. Um, you know, I remember walking in a field where we did Josh and Kirsten's, um, Kristen's photos and there's all these bramble bushes and Joshua was saying to me, like, it's so difficult for farmers to get rid of that because it's harder even to run tractors over it and things like that because it just damages your equipment. So it's very hard and expensive to get rid of thorns and thistles in the field. So I just remember walking through the field and just, you know, just thinking of this, like, wow. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So God has made it this way, and um, you know one of the reasons why I think he has is because it's to correct our focus. Because if life was easy, and life was just everything's just going well, I mean, think about now, I mean, life is not perfect. But, you know, when you live in a prosperous country, you know, your business is doing well, your career is doing well, and, you know, you enjoy a lot of things in life. I mean, do, do you still think about God at those times? I mean, maybe if you're a spiritual person, you will. You know, you'll stop and you'll give thanks to God for the sort of life you live. But human nature is that when life goes well, people tend to forget about God. You know, and uh, then when life doesn't go according to plan, that's when people start reaching out to God. And, you know, I think God, that's why I think God does this for a reason, that, that the cursed world was difficult and had suffering and pain and he allowed these things because I believe that were, were it not like that, were the temporary world pleasant, then we, we, it would be much more difficult for man who has sinful flesh to, to, to have affections on things of heaven. Right, because you, you, would, you would be too focused on the enjoyment and the pleasure of now rather than looking forward to heaven, looking forward to the new earth. Colossians 3.1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. 
You know, and with the children, he talked about laying up treasures uh, in heaven, right? And Jesus said, you know, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if life is hard and things are not perfect here, then you may not see them as treasure, and then your heart will be where the real treasure is, right, in heaven. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So let's talk a bit about heaven. What is heaven? Heaven is God's throne. Right? Heaven is God's throne. But the word heaven is used different ways in the Bible. We see in Genesis 1 um, that the word heaven just is also used as just the sky as well. But, um, you know, the Bible, a lot of people think the Bible talks about heaven in three different ways, right? You've got the heaven, which is the sky, it's our atmosphere. And then you've got the heavens, which is the next heaven is then the universe, right? Where the stars are and everything like that. And um, in Genesis, it's heaven and then they believe he divided the heavens. And then there's the water under the heaven and above the heaven. So people believe that outside of the universe, there's a layer of water. And then that's the third heaven, and that's where God's throne is, right? Um, but you see here in Genesis 1, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So I, I believe the firmament is just like the, the atmosphere, the space, right? I don't believe like, like the people that believe in a flat earth, they believe the firmament is this glass dome. I think the, the lights being in the firmament is just saying there's, there's, mat, there's the earth and then the firmament, which is like the air. So it's in there. So in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So that's talking about the sun and the moon. So you see that. But he says here, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. That's the sun, the moon, and the stars. God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule the day, to, and to rule over the day and over the night, divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And, in the, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And then it says here in verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So you see there that there's the heavens, the sky, and then the heaven, we always talk about the space, you know, where there's no atmosphere. That's also the, the open firmament of heaven. So 2 Corinthians 12, we, we, we see Paul, and a lot of people believe this is Paul talking about when he was stoned, that he was stoned in a town and he was dragged out and then somehow he revived. So a lot of people believe he actually died in that stoning, but he was actually revived by God and then he went back into the city to preach and a lot of people believe that this chapter is talking about his death experience where he died and came back and he actually saw heaven uh, and where God's throne is it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord I knew a man in Christ above 14 years whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth so you see how he's a lot of people believe he's talking about himself in the third person, like he knew somebody who had this experience, but he's like, you're not saying it's him. He's, like, he's not sure whether it was in the body or out of the body. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So you see how you know, the third heaven is referred to as like God's throne because you've got sky, you, you know, space, and then God's heaven, where, where God's throne is. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. So in Revelation 4, we, we see a brief picture of this throne in heaven. Revelation 4, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard, which as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders 
sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So you see, this is heaven, right? And it's quite an interesting picture here. We're going to read a bit more. Um, you know, and we as believers will spend some time here. But this is not when people think about heaven and they think, you know, when we die, you know, we're going to be like, you know, we're going to have wings with bows and sitting in the clouds, you know, like that, that's sort of, that, that's, that's not true, you know, like, you know, yes, heaven is up there and this is where people get this idea of heaven being in the clouds and whatnot, but that's not where we spend eternity. We don't spend eternity in this place, but this is, cur this is currently where God rules from, right? The spirit of God is in this, this uh, you know, is it another dimension? Who knows mechanically how it works? Verse 6, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like under crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. So I believe these, these creatures here are the seraphims, right? that have the six wings, so you can see that there's four seraphims there and they have different faces. And they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Can you imagine being a seraphim? Like that's your only job. Your only job is to be there flying and telling God how holy he is. Um, and when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know, everyone, uh, you know, when, they, when we think about the Trinity and we think about how God is, everyone wonders, like, what are we going to see when we get to heaven? Um, you know, and who, who's sitting on the throne? You know, like I, I believe it's Jesus Christ on the throne, not the man. So what, what I believe we will see and what I believe Stephen saw is you, you, won't, you won't be able to see the person on the throne. There'll be somebody sitting on the throne, but it's like, it will be too bright that you'll just see the glory of the person sitting on the throne, right? whatever that figure is. But you'll be able to see the lamb, right? So the lamb is like the image of God. It's the man, Christ Jesus. And that's who you see on the right hand of God. But obviously that man is the, the one sitting on the throne too, uh, the spirit. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, but I, I think we do get some insight into what is seen because Stephen says he looks up to heaven and he sees the glory of God and Jesus on the right hand of God. So I think that's what we see in heaven. Isaiah 6, this is Isaiah's vision of it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you see how Isaiah refers to the seraphims, and then in Revelation you get a bit more of a description of what these seraphims look like, and four have different, um, different faces. Now, in Ezekiel, we're told of different, you know, Ezekiel, obviously, his appearance, his vision of heaven, and, you know, the Ezekiel vision is, is he, he, everyone knows about Ezekiel's wheels, you know, but um, I'm not going to talk about that, but I just wanted to point out these creatures here in Ezekiel, I think, are different to the seraphims. So you've got the seraphims, you've got the cherubims, which, which I believe Satan was a cherubim, you've also got the angels in heaven. You've got also the believers who have died and are saved in heaven as well. And you've got these creatures here. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces and every one had four wings. See, so I don't believe these are the four seraphims described in Isaiah on Revelation because they each had four faces, right? Whereas the seraphim... In Revelation, there was four of them, but each one had a different face. But this one has four faces, and they had four wings, as opposed to six wings. Now, so this is a picture. So we get a brief glimpse into heaven. That's what heaven is, right? But this is not what the new earth is, you know? Now, heaven, heaven 
It's not a sinless place. You know, it might be a bit jarring for you, but see, what you're thinking is, see, the new earth is a sinless place. Right? Not even like when Jesus comes back, the thousand-year reign is not a sinless place. Right? There's still people that are not saved. There's people that Jesus is ruling over with a rod of iron. Right? Heaven is God's throne. It's not necessarily a sinless place. Why is that? Well, Job 1, we see here the story of Satan and Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now remember, Satan had already sinned. He'd already, he's already a, a sinful cherub, right? But here he is in heaven, presenting himself before God. So this is why. So heaven is not a place where there's no sin. There's nothing sinless. Obviously, God is sinless, but um, there, there is... There are sinful beings in there, but I don't think there will be sinful man in there because man, when they die, go to hell, right? But there are beings that are not yet condemned that are like Satan and the, all the angels that, that, are, that are loyal to Satan. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Whence is from where? From where did you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So you can see here in Job, Satan is able to move between areas. You know, I don't know if you call them dimensions or whatever, but he's able to, to go to heaven where God is, not just, the uni just, not just the universe. He's able to go where God is, and he's able to visit earth, right? And, and go around the earth, walking up and down in it. Revelation 12. See, this is where uh, Satan is cast out of heaven. So, see, so some people think when Satan sinned, that's when he fell and he was cast out of heaven. No. He's, he's, he's rebelling against God, but God has a purpose for him. He's going to and fro on the earth, serving God's purpose, right? In the sense that he's being used to test people, right? But it's not until the end times that there's a war in heaven. Revelation 12, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. See, so it's not until Revelation 12 where now Satan does not have a place in heaven, right? And the great dragon, verse 9, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Right, So it's, it's just the fact that he lost his ability to be able to go to heaven now. Now they're cast out of heaven, and now he can only be on the earth. Right, And then we know in Revelation his time's short, right? because eventually he gets bound, thrown into the uh, bottomless pit. Um, here's another example in uh, 1 Kings 19. Oh, sorry, 1 Kings uh, 22, verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Um, I can't remember who this was exactly. I can't remember his name, but it's in here later. It's, uh, it's when the, the king is deciding whether to go uh, to battle and wondering whether uh, he, he's going to win or not. And, and one of the, the wise men sort of speak up and is the only one going against the king and because everyone else is telling him, oh, go to battle, you're going to win it. And there's one that says, no, this is the vision he saw in heaven. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab, so if you remember Ahab was married to Jezebel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab's asking everyone he wants to go, but everyone's telling him, yeah, you're going to win it, but there's one prophet that says, no, this is the vision I saw. And one said on this matter, and another said on that matter. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. So if you don't understand, overly understand what's going on, so Ahab is asking his people, this one prophet is going against all the others, and he's saying this vision that he saw in heaven, right, where God is basically talking with the people that, well, the, the, the creatures that are presented before him, the spirits and things like that. So he's saying, the Lord said, verse 20, who's going to persuade Ahab that he'll go up and he'll die in this battle? And so the spirits are talking amongst each other. They came forth, the spirit stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. 
And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Right? So you say, well, it's impossible for God to lie. But then God is, is fine with using the evil in the world, right, for his purposes. Right? That's why sometimes people wonder, like, if there's, if there's a loving God, why does he allow Satan to exist? Right? And you've got to understand, because Satan has a purpose in this fallen world to test God's believers, like he did with Job, but also to punish unbelievers, right? Like he's going to do with Ahab here, right? So he does use them, but that doesn't mean God is a liar. He's just using the will of these spirits for his purposes. And that's a great way to understand, you know, why there is suffering in the world, you know, why there is life is hard and things like that, because God has a, a greater purpose for it. So we see here that, you know, heaven... You don't want this idea of heaven being this sinless place. You just need to understand that heaven is God's throne, right? And don't get mixed up between heaven and the new earth, right? Even though that's what people will colloquially or commonly call the new earth. They'll say we will die and we'll go to heaven. And we'll get to that in a moment. So we don't actually spend eternity in heaven, technically, we actually spend eternity on a new earth. Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what happens is when Jesus comes back, those of us who are saved at that point in time will be resurrected into the new bodies. Those who are saved after that time will, will not take part in this thousand year reign. You know, you may live through the, the tribulation and the wrath and then die in the thousand year reign, if an unbeliever, if they get saved after Jesus returns. But those of us who are saved when Jesus returns, that's the first resurrection. And then there's a thousand year reign with Jesus on this earth, on the current earth that we're on. Revelation 20, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So this is after the thousand year reign. There's the white throne judgment, right? Everything is away. That's when the Bible talks about the elements shall melt with fervent heat because everything's gone. Now it's just the white throne judgment. Everyone's there, saved and unsaved. They come out. Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So see, that's what we, people think about when they think about heaven. They're actually thinking about this new heaven. So there's a new heaven... And there's a new earth, but what's interesting about the new earth, see, the current earth, and really all you wait, the only, and this is how I think of it, right? Really the way you just have to think about it is, you know, the way the garden was created was like a perfect paradise. And remember, like, God communed among them. He lived among Adam and Eve. Remember, he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, right? So he lived among them. But it's like when they sinned, you know, his dwelling place was heaven, right? And there was the tabernacle that was like a picture of heaven and things like that. But then there's going to come a day when there's new heaven and the new earth. And look here, God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this, it's like, you just got to think of the new earth as like a restoration of Eden. You know, so sometimes people wonder like, well, what is the new earth going to be like? We get some clues in the Bible. But just think like, well, whatever it was like, for Adam and Eve, that's what it's going to be like for us on the new earth. That's what I think. So there's going to be things to do. There's going to be work. There's going to be communities, things like that, things to do. There just won't be any pain and dying and things like that. So then you say, Victor, like, why does our gospel track say how to know you're going to heaven? Why doesn't it say how to know you're going to the new earth? Well, one is, you know, just doesn't have the same ring to it, right? I mean, people just understand, like, so you, they, they think heaven and hell. But this is not actually doctrinally wrong, right? Because, 
you know, we can say that, you know, well, if somebody was to die right now, they, they don't go to the new earth immediately, right? So where they go if you were to die right now is either heaven or hell. So this is not a wrong statement. So you don't want to, you don't want to think, and maybe this is just the way I think. Maybe you guys don't even think this way. You know, I think, you know, like, oh, this is not, uh, I was the sort of believer that if I learned a doctrine like this, I'd be like, hey, wait a second, this is not technically correct then. Why are we writing something te technically incorrect? But I'm saying, no, it is still technically correct because if you were to die immediately today, immediately you'd go to heaven, right? Because the new earth is something that comes later. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Where's the Lord? The Lord's in heaven, right? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So even Jesus on the cross, when he said to the thief, right, he said, the thief said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And remember Paul said he went up to the third heaven, he went to paradise. So if somebody was to die today, immediately they would go to heaven, they would be in paradise. But you just need to understand doctrinally, in the long run, eternity you will actually spend eternity on a new earth, not on the, on the, in the new heaven. So what will this new earth be like? Well, I already gave you a bit of clue, you know, like just, I think just think of it like the Garden of Eden was, you know. Um, but maybe we're still wearing clothes. I don't know, they're not wearing clothes in the Garden of Eden until the fall. So, you know, I think heaven, maybe, maybe they're like, that. that's right, there are some differences probably. <laughs> Although maybe, maybe, I don't know. Like, I'm not, not going to, maybe, maybe we won't be wearing clothes. It just won't be weird. Like, it wasn't weird in the uh, Garden of Eden. So what will it be like? Um, let's talk about a few things. So the new earth will be sinless, right? Revelation 21, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. I think this is going to be one of the greatest things about, you know, you know, once we part. I mean, I know it's hard to think about it now because death is not pleasant. Nobody looks forward to death. But, you know, do you ever get the thought sometimes when you think, oh, man, the, the day I die, uh, my faith will be made sight. Um, and I always wonder, like, you know, when you close your eyes, finally, what will you see? I have that thought. I don't know if you guys have that thought. You know, I always, I always like, wonder, like, you know, what's it going to be like to sit down with Jesus and uh, have a conversation? You know, like, that's why people like to listen to these long-form podcasts. You know, you kind of feel like you're sitting at a conversation with somebody that's very interesting. Gosh, imagine what it's going to be like sitting with Jesus. I mean, the disciples got to experience that, but none of us have. Um, I think that's going to be, you know, that's something to look forward to. That's why I originally called my sermon Looking Forward to Heaven. Uh, but, you know, maybe I should have called it Looking Forward to the New Earth. Uh, <clears throat> they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, verse 26. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, see, people read this, they think about heaven. And I'm just teaching you today that that's not technically correct. Heaven is, Satan can go there. This is talking about the new earth, right? That there will in no wise enter into it anything that worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, it's sinless, right? It's a sinless place. And, you know, sometimes Christians, because, you know, you live in the world and, you know, you enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, like the Bible says. So you think sin is pleasure, is, is the only source of pleasure, which is not true, right? Like, the, you know, people think, you know, often when you, you, you know, you're trying to convince somebody to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and Christian, they say, like, oh, but the Christian life is boring. Well, that's not true. You know, the Christian life is not boring. The Christian life does not have to be boring. You know, we're not monks, do you know what I mean? We're not, and we're not Catholic monks, you know? Like, people think that, oh, once you become a Christian, you're just like, no fun, you know, no... And, and some fundamental Christians treat Christianity like that. Anything fun, they just find something wrong with it. It's like, Christians just can't do any of it. 
right? That's not the case, you know? It's, it's like, um, I don't think the Christian life is boring. You know, I don't think it's pleasureless. I don't, you know, one thing it definitely will never be is purposeless. You know, and that's one thing life can be if you don't have an eternal perspective that life can lack purpose, you know, lack an eternal purpose. Because what's the, what's the point? Like Ecclesiastes says, what's the point of life if you just die and it's over? You know, you might say, well, the point of life is just to live for this 80, 90 years. But is that, is, that, is that a fulfilling purpose? Is that really, you know, what life is about? And I think, you know, God putting eternity on our hearts makes us yearn for something greater than that. Like, you know, there's, there's a bigger purpose than just this brief vapor of life that we have. And, and that's something the Christian life has that, that the non-Christian life will not have. Um, so if, if the Christian life is not fun, not interesting, not purposeful, then you're not doing it right. Because you know, I think it is. You know, I think we have things to fight for. And the things that people tend to associate pleasure with, with, with sin, you know, if you think about it, it's either sex, drugs, or money. And, you know, obviously sex is not missing in the Christian life. You know, you've got marriage. Drugs is just about having pleasure, right? And there's nothing, there's nothing great about being addicted to some substance that just wastes your money and destroys your body. But there is pleasure in life, in the Christian life. You know, you enjoy food, you enjoy certain things. It's not like you're not allowed to enjoy these things. You know, you're not, it's not like you're not allowed to go and have some R&R with your family and go enjoy the world. There's a place for that stuff. So it's not like the Christian life precludes you or excludes you from enjoying those things. And obviously you can, you can make money. You can enjoy the things in life. But it's just why are you making money? Why, you know, this is why... So the Christian life is not this life of a monk. You know, people say, oh, I could, I'm not going to wake up early on Sunday mornings. I mean, people wake up earlier for work than they wake up for church. Amen. I mean, I don't see how... Like, you know, you go to work, most people work nine to five and you've got to wake up at seven or whatever and beat the traffic and then they complain about coming to church on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You know, it's like almost lunchtime. So, it's, uh, the Christian life I don't think is born. You know, and godliness gives lasting joy. When you, live a, when you live a godly life and you do something of eternal value, it's something that lasts, you know, there's only so much joy you can get out of building something that's going to eventually be burnt. Am I right? Yeah, is, is, there some, is there some happiness in building something successful, you know, some sense of accomplishment? But there's only so much you can get from that when you realize it's one day going to be gone. But when you build towards something of eternal value, there's, there's a lasting sense of joy because you know I've made an investment in my eternity that I know will be waiting for me when I get there, and it's going to last eternity, you know, that, 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 that reward that you've earned is forever. Sin also causes a lot of suffering. You know, like there's pleasures of sin for a season causes a lot of suffering in this life. A lot of heartache, relationship breakup, financial ruin, all this sort of thing, you know. And, and those are the things that people don't think of when they see the rosy garden of sin. And they don't realize the, 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 you know, the, the, the ugliness behind it all. Okay? So heaven's going to be a great place. Well, the new earth is going to be a great place. Revelation 21.4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for well, these words are true and faithful. You see how dwelling on eternal things it encourages you. you know, I'm hoping you guys are a bit encouraged today to think, you know, it's something to look forward to. You know, life is hard, but it's not, it's not that bad in comparison. We know what we have something, we have something to look forward to. Number two, it's going to be a place of great joy. Isaiah 65, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. I mean, that, that verse actually reminds me of, uh, you know, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, when he says, the things in heaven are not even worthy to be compared, you know, with the glory that shall be revealed. I mean, it's like saying here, like, you know, it's not that you're just going to forget. Maybe it's just you're not going to be thinking about it anymore because it's not even worthy to be compared to the things that happen on the earth, the things that you're going to experience in heaven. 
But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no, be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. Right? So this is talking about the tragedy of early death. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So Old Testament passages sometimes have a bit of physical application and, you know, spiritual application. So we know and the reality of is we live forever, but, you know, he's just saying long life and giving an example there because there's some physical application too to him blessing them in the, in the, in the land. Now, so we see here from Isaiah 65, you know, there's enjoyment we see there that there's going to be a home. You say, like, well, where do we live on the new earth? Well, like today, I think there will be communities. There will be a hierarchical structure. You know, we're going to see that a bit later. So you're going to live, I think, in towns and cities. You're going to build a house. You're going to live in a house. You're going to build a vineyard. You're going to have a garden. And, you know, there's going to be business. There's going to be commerce. Right? There's nothing sinful about commerce. But there's just not going to be any more sin in commerce, if that makes sense. So it's going to be like a, like a perfect economic system. It's going to be very interesting. So we see there work, home, working. We see eating, right? Jesus saying here, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day <coughs> that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right? So you say, well, in heaven, we're going to be eating like we do now. Right? So there's going to be the enjoyment of food. Um, I put this in here because I, I remember putting this point in this sermon because people would wonder, like, I wonder where the animals go to the new earth. You know, like if my, my dog or my guinea pig, you know, will I see them? <laughs> now, I don't, I don't believe in the sense that, you know, that they like, are like humans. But I, I thought of this verse when I was thinking of that topic at the time that I don't see any reason why that if you wanted to live on the new earth with your old pets that have passed away, that God can't, for whatever reason, resurrect them for you to enjoy. Do you know? So I just thought of this verse, you know, or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So I... I don't think it's, it would be out of the ordinary for somebody, you know, because some people maybe didn't have children on this earth. They lost their pets, and, you know, the people can be, form very close relationships with their animals. That, that same animal with its same personality could be resurrected for you to enjoy as a companion in heaven. Um, I don't see why that can't be the case. All right, number three, it's going to be a place of rest. Like we talked about life being hard. It's go, go, go. You know, we run out of time. We have to work hard. We labor. Um, you know, part of the reason why we have to labor so hard is because the bloody government takes so much and wastes it. But Matthew 8 says here, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You know, just that thought. You know, it's funny that, you know, just going back here, where it was talking about the new place, where it's saying, uh, you know, shall not, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. And sometimes we, you know, generally I think of those verses like somebody is stealing off you, like a thief comes in, 
But it just sometimes it's human government, right? Like where you work so hard, but other people enjoy the fruit of your labor when a population is overtaxed. I think of that too. So it's going to be a place of rest. You see, you're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. All right? Many are going to come. So it's going to be a place of fellowship as well. A place where you can sit down, not just talk to Jesus, but you can talk to people of the past as well. You can talk with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And he ends that chapter with, you know, comfort. He says in Thessalonians, comfort one another with these words. So you see, you're gonna, it's going to be a place of fellowship. Man, the sort of people, the stories, the wisdom that you can learn from these people. You know, meet believers throughout the ages, not just believers that you knew that you lost in life, but it'd be interesting also to meet like, you know, the people throughout the ages that were martyrs in the faith and to hear their stories and talk to them. That would be very interesting too. I mean, I don't even know how long that would take you to sit down. I mean, you're in no rush in heaven, you know, where you can sit down and talk and have these great conversations with all the people all throughout the years. This is what, this is some of the things we're going to do on the new earth. Now, like I said, <clears throat> number four, in the new earth, we're not going to be all of equal stature. There will be hierarchy in the new earth. Right, in this new world. Matthew 5. This is uh, the parable of the talents. Whosoever uh, therefore shall break one of the least... Oh, sorry, this is not the parable of the talents. This is a different passage, I think. I've got, I go to the parable of the pounds later. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you see that in the kingdom of heaven, we're not all equal. There is least and great. Luke 19, 15, And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by training. So this is the parable of the, of the ten pounds, right? Of the pounds. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, our good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou, look at this, authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. So our rewards in heaven do not just amount to the things that we may obtain in heaven. It doesn't just amount to the people that we've won to Christ, Right? But one reward in heaven is the amount of authority you will have in heaven. Right? Because you, if you are faithful with what you have today, that's, this is why. It's like, are you faithful over the things you have authority over in this life? Because you're proving to God, will you be faithful with the authority that he will give you in heaven? Right? To be over five cities. So there might be people, a lot of people in the new earth that have authority in no cities. They're just one of the citizens of this new earth. But those that have served God and been faithful to God will have a higher level of authority in those cities. Now, obviously, we're, we're, there's no corruption in this new earth. So you'll, you'll rule and reign as you see fit. But isn't it, isn't it interesting? Because I, I believe in the new earth, it's, it's not just going to be like a homogenous society, right? So you may... If you are successful in being over some cities or being over an area, you may govern it differently to somebody who lives in another part of the new world. You know, so I think there's going to be, you know, that maybe that sort of, hey, where, where would you like to live? Or maybe you know, for a thousand years you live in this city. And you say, I want something different. A thousand years you live in a different city. And there's going to be like different buildings, just like there is today. You know, so it's just, I think there is going to be like a great amount of diversity in the new earth. It's not just going to be like just one global city. There's going to be one ruler, Jesus Christ, but I think there'll be some autonomy amongst the cities. It'll be interesting. And last one, number five, it's forever. It's forever. So there's going to be no more rush 
there's going to be plenty of time, you know, no, no end of life, um, you know, and, and people wonder, like, well, will we get bored in the new earth? Because you can't imagine living forever, and you might think, like, will you, will you run out of things to do? Uh, and I don't believe so. And we don't know exactly what this new earth is like, but I think, you know, it, you know, I mean, think about how much the world has changed just over the thousand years of people on this earth. The different type of architecture and cultures and, I mean, you probably couldn't even go and visit and see, like people travel because they like to see all this diversity. You probably can't even see it all in, you know, a thousand years or however many years, right, to try and really experience it. You know, you could live there a bit and go, whereas right now when you go and visit on holiday, you can't, you can't really experience like somebody that, that's lived there. But on the new earth, you could, right? So then maybe by the time you like go over here, like this part of the earth is, is already changing. So it's like just constantly, you know, there's constantly things to do and constantly things to see. And there's probably experience as well that we, we don't even know of yet. Look at what Psalm 16, 11 says. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Right, so there are, there are things that we, we don't even know that can exist in this new earth. And, you know, it's something to look forward to. So we don't want it. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay, so I hope you learned something there. I think it was an interesting sermon to you. Just the, just the last thought I want to leave you with. Like I asked you the question about, do you really believe there's a hell? I mean, do you really believe that there's a life after death? Do you really believe that this life is temporary? Do you really believe, you know, once you die, you'll be in a place, new earth, and the things we talked about today? Because that should change the way you live, right? So the verse I want to leave you on is, is Colossians 3. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. All right, so let's make sure we're living for eternity. You know, and don't be discouraged by how this world is. We have something to look forward to. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the insight you give us into the new earth, into the afterlife. Thank you, Lord, that it's just something just... We can't even imagine how great it's going to be, Lord. Something that we can look forward to. Help us, Lord, to have an eternal perspective. Help us to live for eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.